reputably rubbish on one of the non-canon movies that James Bond aficionados love to ignore. I would like to quickly thank James of the USS Reliant, currently en route to SETI Alpha 6, for suggesting this movie. Don't worry, James, I'm sure it's just going to be a routine check. Never Say Never Again, the much maligned and most polarizing of the James Bond films. So much so that many avid fans of the franchise refuse to acknowledge that the film even exists. The title itself was inspired by the wife of Sean Connery in her mocking his response to reporters asking the question if he would ever consider returning to the iconic role. The tale of Never Say Never Again could be viewed as an underdog story enshrouded in lawsuits, dueling egos, and betrayal. In many ways, it's a miracle that the film was ever made. There are several well-done videos covering the drama on the origins of this film, so we are going to do our quick abridged version. Are we really going to do this? Of course we are. It's important that they know the history. Fine. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is with misplaced sense of pride that the reputably rubbish Traveling Actors Guild presents... Bum, 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 bum. Good lord. The abridged drama of what happened 25 years before the production of Never Say Never Again even started. Tis I, Ian Fleming. The scribe who created the master spy, James Bond. It is now the year of our Lord, 1958, and I wish to pen another adventure. Who is it I see? Tis none other than Kevin McClory, Jack Whittingham, and Ivor Bryce. Fellows, shall you join me in the authorship of a screenplay? that shall be called Longitude 78 West. Yeah, okay. Oh, sounds good. I don't see anything that could go wrong here. The screenplay is started, but lo, Ian Fleming grows bored and abandons the project. The dawn of 1961 is upon us, and the temptation grows like a seed in the mind of Mr. Fleming. I shall transform the screenplay of Longitude 78 West to a book and call it Thunderball. I shall not give my co-authors credit as I have changed the title and can think of no other reason for this betrayal. The news of the betrayal brought Kevin McClory, Jack Whittingham, and Ivor Bryce to the goddess of justice to stop the publication. Oh, justice, please stop this vile publication. No. Fine, then. We shall try again in two years, but this time sue him for plagiarism. Let it be so. You will settle out of court, but you, Kevin, will be granted 35,000 pounds and the television and film rights to Thunderball. Well, you will have producer credit of the 1965 film Thunderball. You will be thereafter cursed and restricted in your use of the James Bond property. Uh, all right. And so it was. Kevin was locked in legal battles over James Bond until 2001 and died in 2006, exactly 43 years after the Thunderball court case. In 1964, Ian Fleming passed on after his third heart attack, partly due to the stress from the lawsuits and partly to smoking 60 cigarettes a day. Woe to the tobacco! Woe! No, no, stop applauding. You're only encouraging him. That was not a drama, that was a tragedy. And what was the whole point of it? I need the viewers to understand that there were a lot of different legal pressures that Kevin McClory was facing when he decided to do the remake of Thunderball. But instead, he called it Never Say Never Again. There was now a defined legal split between what was on and off the table for both Kevin McClory and Aeon Productions, owned by Cubby Broccoli and Harry Salzman, 
who were making the Canon films. Aeon Productions developed through the Canon films many of the non-book icons of the films, such as the gun barrel, the opening sequences, and Bond theme music. Kevin McClory kept the rights to the characters of Blofeld and Spectre, which is why you haven't seen or heard from Spectre until the 2015 film after Kevin died. Wasn't Blofeld killed at the beginning of For Your Eyes Only? The opening scene of For Your Eyes Only only had the likeness of Spectre leader Blofeld, with no actual mention of his name. It did not break the legal contract, but it did not go unnoticed. A James Bond movie without the Bond music, gun barrel, or opening sequence? That's like asking Gordon Ramsay to make a show without cooking, swearing, or making the contestants cry. It's just... empty. Well, the production team unfortunately made the situation worse. They hired legendary Academy Award winning composer James Horner to score the film, but Sean Connery, having production power, removed James Horner and replaced him with Michael Legrand. This gave the music more of a lighthearted jazzy feel, which removed much of the tension in what was supposed to be a spy thriller. They hired legendary film director Ivan Kirshner, which seemed like a good idea, but like how Sean Connery could not get along with producer Jack Schwartzman, who is also the father of Jason Schwartzman, director Kirshner couldn't get along with, well, anyone. Kirshner also said that the script was designed to satisfy a contract more than an audience, which, for legal reasons stated earlier, was exactly what it was. Star Sean Connery was 24 years older than leading Bond girl Ken Basinger, Basinger, <sighs> Vicky Vale. Ridiculous sequences were added to the script to increase the action, but these included remote control sharks and 80s video games. The studio wanted a larger than life opening number similar to the canon films, but with legal restrictions, the production was forced to place the title song over the opening action sequence. This again sapped the tension for what was otherwise going to be a memorable sequence. But the largest error in judgment came in sharing the same release date as the canon Bond film, Octopussy, starring Roger Moore. Bond vs. Bond. With both films doing respectively well in the theater, Octopussy is still viewed as one of the best Bond films, while Never Say Never Again is largely forgotten. There were a lot of factors playing against Never Say Never Again, going back decades. However, if Jaws has taught us anything, not that one, the one with the shark, uh... It's that a difficult production can force the filmmaking team to get more creative and make the movie better. So, was Never Say Never Again good or bad? Well, the movie's a bit of a mixed bag. The plot of Spectre stealing several nuclear weapons and holding the world ransom is not anything new, as this movie is a remake. The plot is so well used that it's parodied in Austin Powers. Due to the de-aging makeup and hair effects for Sean Connery, they made a 1960s looking James Bond run around in a 1980s world. Unless it turns out that James Bond is actually a time traveler, this does not exactly feel right. The visual effects were standard 80s fare. We also have Rowan Atkinson making an appearance as an inept new agent, bringing comedy relief to a movie that really doesn't need it because the music does not allow any scene to actually build tension. Surprisingly, with all of these production issues, the film was not disjointed. The production design was a stylish mix of 80s aesthetic and classic European elegance. The cast was well-rounded, with actors showing through their performances that they understood the characters, and even Sean Connery slipped seamlessly back into the Bond role like one of his tailored suits. The largest standout role was with Barbara Carrera's Golden Globe-nominated performance of Fatima Blush. Everything about this character was understood and expertly executed. In a sequence where she had to kill a now disposable henchman, she pulls her car alongside his, throws a snake into his vehicle, the panic driver goes off the road, she then puts a bomb inside the car, saves the snake, comforts the snake, and then nonchalantly blows up the car 
and drives off to continue on with her day. A lot of critics of this sequence called into question the gratuitousness of what she just did. Why throw the snake in the car when she could have thrown the bomb in the car? Simple. Because she's wackadoo. It tells us everything we need to know about her character. For her, it's not about the kill. It's about the joyous rapture that she gets from bringing about death. Her monologue at her demise plays two roles. Practically, it was a shoehorn sequence that gave James Bond the ability to position his exploding pen. Character-wise, it was to stroke her ego and have the world's greatest spy put down in writing that she was the best sex of his life. Freak respects freak. If Fatima Blush and Xenia Anatop had a spin-off film where they had to hunt and kill one another, it would have been rated X and shown in the seediest of New York theaters. Her costume design was flawless, with giving her a closet that would have made the contestants of RuPaul's Drag Race pink with envy. And girl, could she work? Do you need a moment? Shut up! She was the best part of the movie! Then wrap it up before you get too emotionally attached and write another Greek tragedy about your lost 80s love. You haven't already, have you? <sighs> okay, to wrap things up, there is a lot to enjoy in Never Say Never Again, and I do feel that it would have gotten a lot more respect if it was one of the original canon films. But, it was a remake of one of the most iconic of the canon films. For many, as a remake, this film is like a McDonald's cheeseburger. Your brain knows it has the same name, ingredients, and components as an actual cheeseburger, and you might actually enjoy eating it. But after you're done, your stomach will ask, why didn't you just eat an actual cheeseburger? And I'm not against remakes. If enough time has passed, or if they have an interesting reimagining, or if they offer something that the audience haven't seen before, I'm all for it. Which is why the 2006 remake of Casino Royale with Daniel Craig worked. But Never Say Never Again had none of these. And this film only exists out of spite for the author Ian Fleming. There is no other remake that I can think of that actually cast the original actor as the same starring role. For these reasons, I feel Never Say Never Again, while enjoyable, is unfortunately unnecessary. And the best remake of Thunderball really truly is Austin Powers. Thank you again, James, for the suggestion of this film. I hope the mission is going well. If any of you feel that there is a movie that deserves a defense, Please, by all means, comment below, let me know. Until then, have an amazing day. Thank you for watching this talkie picture. Please leave a message down below, select the like picture, and subscribe to be a member of our community. Thank you.